Good evening. Welcome to part two of the ninth annual Shoki Jewish Family Service Saul Cohn Lecture. I'm Paul Gordon, the president of Shoki Jewish Family Service. Tonight is the second of our series of three lectures with the theme, Recover, Recharge, and Rejoice. On January 13th, you heard Jason Rosenthal's poignant presentation around the theme of recover. Tonight, Tiffany Schlein's remarks will focus on the theme of recharge. And on April 27th, Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar's theme will be rejoice. I hope you'll all join us again on April 27th. Now, let me say that we're not being totally idle between now and April 27th. Most of you should have received an invitation to our annual Shoki JFS evening being held virtually on March 14th. You can also learn about this event where we will be honoring three terrific heroes of our community on our website. I hope you will all consider joining us. Among the many people I want to, I'd like to acknowledge and thank for tonight's events are the members, uh, are the members of the Saul Cohn Lecture Committee, co-chaired by Betsy and Mike Stone. I thank Betsy and Mike for their leadership in making this happen. I also want to recognize the uniqueness of this year's event in that the two federations in our catchment area are co-sponsoring this series. So thank you to the United Jewish Federation of Stamford, Duquesne, and Darien, and the Federation for Jewish Philanthropy of Upper Fairfield County, and their leaders, Diane Sloyer and David Weisberg, not only for joining us tonight as co-sponsors, but for being so supportive of us during this very challenging year. Most importantly, I, I, I want to thank the Cone family. We were so blessed when Mimi and Saul approached us nine years ago to host this event as their gift to our community. We're so pleased that Mimi and her family have agreed to continue this program in Saul's memory. So thank you to Mimi, uh, Mimi her daughters Amy and Rena, and their husbands Carl and Josh. In a moment, I'm going to introduce Matt Greenberg, the CEO of Shoki JFS. He's going to share some of the extraordinary challenges our agency faced this year and how we have approached these challenges. Make no mistake, as you would expect, these challenges have been unique and extreme, and Matt and the staff showed that they were up to the task. I must take this opportunity to again publicly thank these unsung heroes. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. After Matt, Rena Koppelman, Saul and Mimi's daughter, will speak and introduce Tiffany Schlein. We will have a question and answer session after Tiffany speaks. The only way to ask a question is to submit it in writing using the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. The chat box will not work. You should feel free to enter any questions into the Q and A box anytime during Tiffany's presentation. You don't have to wait until she's done. Once she finishes, our co-chairs, Mike and Betsy Stone, will read the questions to Tiffany and facilitate. Remember, the only way to ask a question is by using the Q&A box. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce the CEO of Shoki Jewish Family Service, Matt Greenberg. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Paul said to you, I also want to welcome you to our ninth annual Saul Cohen Shoki Jewish Family Service Lecture. Tonight is the second installment of what is this year a three part series. So last time, hopefully you join us. Um, Jason Rosenthal spoke about recovering from his loss. Tonight, we're going to hear about we're going to hear from Tiffany Schlein about recharging, especially now in the day and age when we have all moved on to online communications. I don't have to tell you how challenging this year has been for all of us. Last time I shared with you some of the daunting challenges that we faced here at Shoki Jewish Family Service. So during this pandemic, people have continued to line up outside of our doors every single day, sometimes 40 or 50 deep to obtain food from our Friedberg Kosher Food Pantry, which is going to result this year in more than 70,000 meals being provided. We're beginning to gear up for our annual Passover meal distribution. For this year, I imagine we're going to have to distribute to more than 350 families. Um, we will be reaching out to you, hopefully, to ask you to um, donate some, some food products so that we can make sure that everybody has what they need for their seders. And because the needs have grown so dramatically, we're very fortunate that we were able to recently partner with Congregation B'nai Israel in Bridgeport to establish a second location to extend their food pantry to ensure that everybody throughout our entire catchment area, ranging from the Greenwich border through Bridgeport, 
has all of the food that they need in order to feed their families. We continue to deliver more than 50 bags of groceries every single week to people who can't get out of their homes. And in addition, hundreds of meals have been provided this year through our Hirsch Kosher Home Delivered Meal Program. Families that have been anxious have turned to us for counseling. They have come to us for uh, all sorts of different programs that we offered on, online. Hundreds of Holocaust survivors have been attending weekly sessions where they've been able to um, meet other Holocaust survivors and talk to other Holocaust survivors. And so like, like Paul, while Rena will talk more about her father in just a few moments, I want to again say to Mimi and to the Cohen family, thank you on behalf of Shoki Jewish Family Service, but also personally as a community member and somebody who benefits from these lectures as well as everybody else. And thank you, Mimi, for your vision and your compassion and for dreaming up the ideas and then making them happen. And to all of you here tonight, we hope this lecture series is a step in recovering, recharging, and finding a path to joy. Thank you very much. Enjoy the lecture. Thanks, Matt. And thank you all for being here tonight. As my sister said last month at the first event in the series, it is amazing that this is the ninth annual Saul Cohen Shoki JFS lecture and just a week away from our dad's second yard site. Dad loved bringing the community together and would have been so happy to see so many people here tonight, even in Zoom boxes. Moreover, our parents believed in the power of and need for Shoki Jewish Family Service long before COVID increased community challenges exponentially. I am certain that our dad would have been so proud of the work Shoki JFS is doing to meet those needs, and I believe he would have loved tonight's topic, recharge. Growing up, our family kept Shabbat, and that time was sacred. Mostly, it was the only time of the week that dad wasn't out at community meetings. Our Friday night routine was consistent. Mom made an amazing meal, we'd catch up about our week over dinner, and dad would be fast asleep for a nap in his chair before the table was cleaned. The schedule was so predictable that one year to celebrate dad's birthday, mom invited friends over after dinner and they surrounded him quietly while he napped, only to wake him with a rousing yell of surprise. Of course, we didn't have screens to escape from back then, but hours of family games of backgammon and rubbing cube certainly prepared me for pandemic life today. Our speaker tonight, Tiffany Schlein, will be speaking about her experience keeping Shabbat as described in her national best-selling book, 24-6, giving up screens one day a week to get more time, creativity, and connection, which recently won the Marshall McLuhan Outstanding Book Award. Ms. Schlein is an Emmy-nominated filmmaker, founder of the Webby Awards, and star of her one-woman spoken cinema performance, Dear Human, which premiered at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She has received over 80 awards and distinctions for her films and work, including selection for the Albert Einstein Foundation's initiative Genius 100 Visions for the Future, inclusion on NPR's list of best commencement speakers, and being named by Newsweek as one of the women shaping the 21st century. She has had four premieres at Sundance, and the U.S. State Department has showed her films at U.S. embassies around the world. And I love that one of her films is Tribe, the unorthodox, unauthorized history of the Barbie doll and the American Jewish people, because that was pretty much my college essay. So basically, Michelin's bio is lengthy because she is amazing. She's been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Elle, and even on Jeopardy. And during the pandemic, she has not slowed down. She writes in weekly newsletters, of course, called Breakfast of Tiffany's, because what else would it would be called? Giving online talks, making a film for the election, and hosting regular Zoom colleagues with special guests and people from all over the world, including me two weeks ago. Tiffany Schlein, welcome. So happy to have you here with us tonight. That was such a beautiful intro. Thank you, thank you. And I'm so glad you were baking with us. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you. And I loved hearing how this consistent element of Shabbat in your life, um, because I'm gonna share with you my own journey with Shabbat. Um, I am here in Northern California and I did not grow up with Shabbat. And um, I really, my, both my parents are Jewish. My father passed away um, and we were very culturally Jewish and I was bar mitzvah went to high holidays, but I didn't grow up with Shabbat. And um, my father and I were incredibly close. Um, he wrote a lot about the brain. He was a surgeon, he operated on the brain and my mom was a psycho is a psychologist, she's retired now. Um, 
and so I grew up in a very intellectual home. Um, the, we were very Jewish in the, what we ate and humor and, and discussing every issue at length. Um, but I, I think I, I set that stage because again, I loved hearing how Shabbat was such a beautiful element in your life. And, and when I met my husband, um, at Ken Goldberg, and I say that because uh, the film, The Tribe that you referenced, which it looks at American Jewish identity through the history of the Barbie doll. Um, and most people don't know that Barbie was created by a Jewish woman. And I use that as a shill to kind of uncover American Jewish identity. Um, and being a blonde, blue-eyed Jew named Tiffany without a Jewish last name necessarily, no one ever, ever really knew I was Jewish. And then I met my husband, Ken, who was a blonde, blue-eyed Jew from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where there weren't very many Jews. And um, we fell in love and all of our discussions around assimilation and Judaism turned into this film, The Tribe. And um, I'll, I'll make sure that you all can watch that. It's an 18 minute film that I think you will really enjoy. Um, but Ken had grown up with Shabbat and he also talked about it like you talked about it, where it was this beautiful night where there was a special meal and uh, he loved it. And they, they, had, they set their table in a beautiful way and his mother made a special roast chicken and challah and everything. And, but when he talked about it, it was pretty much Friday night dinner. And I have to say, although I didn't practice Shabbat, the, the times I did Shabbat growing up and even with Ken, mostly it was that Friday night meal of um, lighting the candles and having challah. Now I wanna to cut to, for a second, my career. So um, I founded the Webby Awards, um, which is considered the Oscars in the internet. And basically I was the first early adopter on every technology. Um, I had the first, you know, I had an Apple IIe that was even before the Macintosh. I wish I could see you all and say, who had an Apple IIe? Um, and, and I got the Macintosh first. I was super nerdy, super into it and uh, then when in high school, I wrote this program, kind of what if computers could connect because this was before the web and then the web came around and I founded the Webby Awards, which honored the world's best website. So I was like super in, interested in the potential of the internet to connect us in all of these new ways. And Ken and I, he's a professor of robotics. That's, I feel like an important part of the story because he's super into tech too. Like he and I we're very interested in experimenting with technology, but we also can step back and be critical of it. And a lot of our art, artwork has explored that also together. Um, so here we were, uh, we were a young couple. I was running the Webby Awards. He was a young professor at UC Berkeley and we would do Shabbat occasionally. And, and one thing I can tell you is that he lived in Israel for graduate school and where of course the whole country shut down for a full day of Shabbat, unlike the very American Shabbat, unless you're Orthodox Jew, um, the whole country doesn't do anything. And he was really impressed with that. And, it, and he well, was frustrated at first that he couldn't do anything because no buses run or anything, but then um, he said he grew to really enjoy it. And when I first met Ken, he said, oh, I don't, work on I don't work on Saturday, it's Shabbat. And I thought that was so sexy that he was like this young professor that didn't work on a Saturday. He had such a clear boundary and I was a Jew who didn't even grow up with Shabbat. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And he kind of kept that at the beginning, but then the iPhone came out. And I say that because it was a very distinct moment where suddenly the internet was with you every second. And we of course got the first iPhones and I feel like we were one of the first people to get super addicted by it too. And I told you I grew up learning all about the brain. A lot of my films are about neuroscience and the brain. And um, a lot of my writing is about neuroscience. And I felt like my brain was changing. I, I couldn't stay present or focused. And I didn't like the way I felt. And um, I was running the Webbies. Um, Ken and I had had, we had one daughter. And this was about um 2007 or 8 and i had this very dramatic period where my father died of brain cancer and um and ken's and my daughter was born and it happened within days of each other and it was i felt like a moment that actually the pandemic was for the whole world but it was a moment when i felt like life was grabbing me by the shoulders and saying focus on what matters what matters to you and I thought a lot about, I could die at any minute. Um, you know, my father had, had 
had cancer when he was a young man and then it came back in a different form but it was um it was just a very it was just like one of those life moments where i felt like i was questioning the way i was living and how i wanted to live and i told you that we had done you know we did shabbat maybe a couple times a month the dinner the dinner part which is amazing but just that part and we were part of this group called reboot um, which was doing a national day of unplugging and i was really shaken by losing my dad i had this newborn baby and ken and i participated in the national day of unplugging where we turned off all screens from friday night to saturday night and it was amazing and i felt like oh my gosh this is that i got my presence back i felt like i got my soul back and um we did it and then we did it the next week like most people were just doing the national day of unplugging for one day and then we did the next week and the next week, the next week, and I started feeling happier. And I noticed that I laughed a lot more on Shabbat. I slept better. I noticed I felt more productive. I felt more connected to my husband, our kids, myself. And then I started going really deep on Shabbat. I started reading all about it. I was reading Heschel. I was reading the, how profound, how radical the concept of Shabbat was back in the day. Like people just worked every day. No, time had no stop. And it was like the run on sentence of time got a period after each week. And I, the longer I did it, the more profound it became and the benefits that were just rippled out into my life. And then of course my kids' lives. So um, it has now been 11 years that we have done Tech Shabbat and it's been the best thing I've ever done. And um, you know, we have a 17 year old daughter now who's about to go to college next year. And we have an uh, almost 12 year old and so it's also been like this experiment with just raising children with this day that's very analog. And, and I'll, a lot of people want me to describe what it looks like. So I am because people have, especially during the pandemic, and I'll, I'll tell you, our tech Shabbats have been like 10 times more important during the pandemic. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people were like, oh my God, you're probably not going to do tech Shabbat because like Zoom and how are you going to stay in touch? And I looked at them like they were Michigan. I'm like, oh my gosh, it is like we run towards Friday night to turn off all the screens for 24 hours in this whole new way. And our 17 year old daughter Odessa said, you know, this was at the beginning of the pandemic. She said the our tech Shabbat said the only day that she didn't feel like we were in quarantine because it was like the one consistent thing that happened in our life when so many other things changed. And the way we do it is we always have people over on Friday night. So it was interesting, Rena, to hear that yours was just a family event, which is the way it was for my husband. But for us, we always, um, and during the pandemic, we've had them outside at a separate table six feet away, but we usually have our family over or our best friends or anyone we find interesting that we want to get to know better. So we invite them over and we're like, you know, you have any dietary requirements? And by the way, we don't use screens, so don't bring any screens over. So it is a dinner without screens. No one has them in their pockets. They're not around. It is the best meal of the week. It's the best conversation. It's when the conversation flows the most, when people laugh the most. We go deep, we go wide. It's like a Thanksgiving every week. That's the way I describe our Shabbat. We talk about what we're grateful for, something that happened that week that was meaningful. Um, and it's and we make a gorgeous table and I make kala and Ken makes his mom's roast chicken and it's just this incredible incredible night. And then um, we you know and the screens I should say I should have said they they get turned off right before the guests arrive. So the TV, the iPads, the laptops, the iPhones, and we put them all in this kind of little drawer area in the kitchen. And I immediately just feel like I'm set free. I can't really describe it any other ways. I feel liberated. I feel like we have created a society where we are so expected to respond and react and check our email and check the stressful nude feed and so many things that I feel like I'm just in a constant reactive state. And especially this last year with the pandemic and the election, it's just been like, I feel like I'm in recovery right now from that whole period, but I feel so liberated from the expectations upon me. I should say we have a landline in case there's an emergency or I need to call my mom. I love talking to my mom on Shabbat. Um, I can tell you in 11 years that how many emergencies have happened where people need to call our landline? 
I think just like once when um, the presidential election got decided, my sister called and was like, you have to know it happened. But other than that, like really it hasn't run for any emergency, but we have it and that feels good to have. They're very inexpensive to have. We have a landline. They're good for a million things, you know, real emergencies. Like I live in California, there's earthquakes, there's wildfires, there's like cell phone tires go down. It's good to have a landline. Medical emergencies, you lose your cell phone, you can call your cell phone and find, find it. That's another good reason. But anyway, so we've had this wonderful Shabbat meal. And then um, Saturday night, or Friday night, I sleep the best. I sleep so deeply because there's no devices anywhere upstairs that night. And then Saturday, I like to wake up early and I like to write and think. Um, so, oh, one other thing I, I want to mention is that the only people I knew that did a full day of Shabbat were like the two orthodox jews i had ever met because i'm in northern california there's not many here they're in la and new york but um and i remember i was fascinated i was like you know wow you don't carry money you don't drive your car you don't use electricity i mean i remember just like questioning them i was so fascinated they had such clear boundaries and i don't practice it in an orthodox uh, i'm not coming at it actually from a religious way and I, and that's actually what's most exciting to me about writing this book and sharing it is that I felt like doing a full day of rest was unavailable to me because I didn't feel like I was a good enough Jew. No, I didn't. Well, because I didn't feel like I was, I was, I didn't, I'm not an Orthodox Jew. So you can't, you really, you have to be very religious to do that. And I have great respect if you do it from that place, but I didn't feel like it was available to me because I am a cultural Jew. Um, and that's not, that's not where my love of Judaism comes. It really comes from the ideas and the culture, but I, I would say I'm not a religious Jew. So what was so interesting, I love to read and write. And I know if you're Orthodox, you don't write at all. But for me, I just find it is literally the day where all the ideas happen. And I think that's interesting because I am a filmmaker and I'm always trying to get into the creative flow. Like what puts me in the most creative state? And it's always like over 11 years, if I look at all where my ideas happen, they happen on Saturday. What does that say? And actually, I've made a couple of films about creativity and neuroscience. And actually, your brain, the, you know how they say you have your best ideas when you're doing the dishes or taking a shower or going on a walk? It's because your brain is like processing what's already in there and you're, you're digesting information and creating new links because your mind kind of thinks about the future and the past and it bounces around on everything that you've learned that week or everything you're thinking about or ruminating on. And that's where new ideas come from. And the problem is the majority of our time these days, we're stuffing our brains with podcasts and news and email and social media notifications and so much stuff, which is amazing sometimes, but we never give it the time to do its magic, which is the daydreaming and the processing and the digesting. So I do my best my best thinking, I have a journal just for tax Shabbats. I think about, I think about the world to come, which is also what Shabbat is about. Like the more I've read about Shabbat, it's about you're creating a temple in time, as Heschel says, to create space to think about the world you want and the world to come. And I feel like Saturday morning is the morning I think about what I'm wrestling with, what I'm grateful for, what made me laugh that week. What project do I want to, what's happening with the kids? You know, Ken and I will often say, oh, let's save that for Saturday, you know, if it's a bigger conversation. So it's this beautiful space to think big and to, you know, have a more meaningful day. So eventually the kids come down. Um, we usually, they begrudgingly, we always go out in nature on Saturday, which it's not like they're like, oh, okay, like a lot of times we have to push them along, but we go out in nature and then they love it once they're there. We do board games like Rummy Cube and, um, we paint, we play music. You can see my instruments behind me. We cook. It's a very analog day and it's literally my favorite day of the week. And my kids would say it's their favorite day. And it's family day. It's kind of when I was growing up, it was Sunday. We, I would go to Sunday school, we'd have big Alex and cream cheese and all the stores were closed back then. And now of course, everything's 24 seven. Like that's the great, we're open 24 seven. Everything's 24 seven. Well, I don't want to live in a world of 24 seven. And actually one of the reasons, this is my book, I almost called it Tech Shabbat because that's what we call it, but eventually I called it 24 6. And the reason I called it that is because I was also trying to get to the empirical brilliance of Shabbat. I think Shabbat is the best idea of the Jews, hands down. 
it's a brilliant way to live because you're saying work, work, work. And then this one day, no work. And the problem with all these screens, and there's so much stress interspersed with the fun connections, especially during Zoom. I mean, of course, it's been beautiful to connect with. Even this lecture series, so beautiful and the important work that you do at your organization and, and you're able to do so much over Zoom now. And but the problem is you go on Zoom and then you might see a news alert and you get an email and then a text and like boom, boom, boom. It's such a mishmash of things that you're going to be stressed out. And even your leisure time, when you have to take a picture, put a filter, put a witty caption, check the witty caption to people comment, that becomes work too. So we've created a, an environment where we're never down. We never have downtime. And in my book, I talk about like, there's so many theories about productivity. I mean, athletes, you work your body, you need a day of rest, a rest and farmers, you need to let the soil rest to do its thing. You need to let your mind rest. You need to check in with yourself. I just heard this beautiful roomy quote, which I just love, which is like, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but always remember to make appointments to check in with yourself. And I feel like that's the day that I do it. I check in with how I, I quiet the noise and I can hear what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And a lot of people that have gotten the book are single. They don't have kids. They find it just as valuable to have a day where you're living analog. It doesn't need to be mean you need to be alone because a lot of people will make plans with a friend and just say, hey, we're not going to bring our phones. Um, and people have also forgotten that we existed before our phones. So many people say to me, like, how do you make plans? I'm like, well, we just make a plan and stick to it because that's how we existed for the phone and it's kind of fun to live that way too um and so you know i just turned 50 this year i think it's the single greatest thing that i've done in my life for meaning for a sense of being i mean i love that when we're doing shabbat people are doing shabbat all over the world you're connected to something larger than yourself i i think the power of shabbat i think while a shabbat dinner is amazing it's the entrance door to the more profound day of a day of rest that sadly most Jews in America don't take. And I guess I invite through this book you to feel like I can do that. And not only can I do that, but it's going to be the best thing you've done. And you're going to feel like a part of you wake up that's, I think, been dormant because we think all of our power is from being plugged into a screen. And the biggest thing that I will say that the feeling that changes is that when I'm on the internet, and listen, I came from the tech industry. It, the original intention wasn't that it would keep you addicted and glued to the screen, but then the business model made it where they want to glue us to the screens all the time so they can sell us more things. So that's why when you're online, you like, you want more, you want the next stressful news headline, you want another email, you want another social media, you want more, 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 more. You're never gonna get to the bottom of the internet. There's no bottom. You're never gonna get to the bottom of your scroll. It doesn't end. But I can tell you the minute I turn it off every Friday at 6.30, instead of feeling like I'm wanting what I don't have, I feel like I'm grateful for what I have and I feel so present. And that Saturday makes me feel so recharged. And I know that this series, we're talking about recharging and it is literally like I unplug to recharge. And, um, you know, my daughter who's going off to college is like, oh, I definitely plan on doing tech shabbats in college. <laughs> and she thinks it's kept her from high school burnout. So um, I want to I want to go to the uh, discussion portion and hear your questions. But I leave you with this is that this is one of the most beautiful and elegant ideas of our people. And I invite all of you to go deeper and try. And what's the worst thing can happen? You can just try it. And then I can say in my book, in addition to kind of talking about the history and the neuroscience of the why and a lot of ideas about Shabbat and also my personal story in the back is a whole kind of how to like, how do you do this? How do you convince your partner? How do you convince your kids? How do you tell your family? How do you tell your boss? It's all in there. And I kind of really walk you through the how and the why. And with that, I think I'm going to, is I'm going to you, Michael, <laughs> I see you came up on my screen. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I want to say that I, I just turned 52, 50 recently as well, except that now I'm 50, 17 next month. <laughs> um, so we don't really have that in common, even though I really identified with a lot of what you were saying. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us and your journey. 
uh, it's a Jewish journey, even though it didn't, you didn't come to it necessarily as a Jewish journey, but it's clearly a Jewish journey. And uh, we really appreciate your sharing with us. Thank you. I I'm going to turn it over now to Betsy, who's much better than I am at moderating questions and answers. And Excellent. she's going to take us through that. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I, you know, it's interesting. I have used your character strength video a bazillion oh, times. Right. Yay. And this is a, a, a shift, for, um, though I think that they have the kind of at core, the, the, there's a question of values of what really matters. Mm. Um, I found myself thinking, um, as you talked about, as you at, in your presentation, about whether or not what really matters feels spiritual to you, or whether it feels um, uh, more down to earth, more. I mean, mm. I, I'm hearing you describe um, Tech Shabbat as both being very grounding. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if it also is that funny combination of grounding and elevating. I love that. I just got chills. That's a beautiful, I don't really, yes. I mean, I find the Shabbat dinner incredibly grounding. I feel like we have it every Friday. It has taught my daughters how to speak at a table. Like there's no kids table and adult table. It's one table. Um, the conversations are very grounding and the consistency of, we make the exact same thing every week. And <laughs> really <laughs> like literally there's no change except maybe some farmer's market thing, but it's literally the same main course, the same salad, <laughs> but that kind of removes some stress. Cause we're basically having a dinner party every Friday. So we always have people over. So it, I think that's actually a secret to doing it is so you don't have to think, what are we making? Like you make the same thing and you get really good at those dishes, which is why I do the Zoom holiday now. And why Ken, you know, he teaches people his roast chicken. But anyways, the dinner is very grounding and I do feel an elevated of clarity of thinking and perspective on my Saturday morning by myself in the silence. And then I always feel spiritual in nature. And we, we live in California, so we can take these beautiful walks amongst the redwoods, which we usually do some form of beautiful nature walk. So yeah, it has both. And actually, I also love that you're talking about that because again, I feel like most Jews that I know do the Shabbat dinner, which is a very grounding and beautiful thing. But I think the container of the day, the palace in time, the Saturday is um, where great insights can happen that are kind of, you can call them spiritual. I think a lot about that word spiritual because I've had some rabbis tell me, you're the most religious, not religious person I've ever met. Like you're religious about your tech Shabbats <laughs> because I'm very, you know, we always do them. And I think words are, that's like such a big conversation on unpacking what spiritual means. And, but yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I think that. Oh, and I wanted to go back. You mentioned my film, which I think would be fun for your community to see, which is The Science of Character, which is an eight minute film about the neuroscience of character development and values. And, and then we made a Jewish version called The Making of a Mensch, which all mm -hmm. of you will love, kind of the Jewish version of that. But you're right, because it's about like, you know, the positive psychology movement is basically for 70 years, psychology it was like, what's wrong with you and let's fix it. And then Marty Seligman and Peterson said, actually, what's right with you and let's build on that. So your brain will naturally go to a worrying negative place on its own. And you actually have to redirect it to the positive. And the news and the stress of the news and everything is, is negative, 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 scare you, scare you. So you have to have the courage to say, I am gonna carve a whole day of joy and gratitude and presence and it takes courage and it takes a love of commitment of presence and family and all the things I think that matter and will sustain you. So it is a lot about that, that, that body of films I made about, it's like a muscle, like by doing something every week, I'm strengthening the gratitude muscle, the presence muscle. Cause you know, the other six days I can be like the rest of us where I'm feeling, Oh my God, I'm all over the place. Or you need to get off my phone or, and in the book, I talk about all these other practices I do the other six days that kind of attempt to keep me off the screens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the screens are designed clearly to make us addicted. I mean, that yeah. those three little dots on, oh on text messaging uh, say, wait, 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 wait. Uh, here. Um, yeah, come um, here. Yeah. Tell me, um, 
uh, tell me about the neuroscience of um, turning it off, of tuning out. What does it do in your brain? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. So when you're focused on something, your brain is in a mode called the task positive mode, and you're just like focused. But when you space out, so unplug, daydream, go off the screen, and your mind, I like to think of it, I have a dog, which I think you can see on the screen because she's like right there. She's um, in it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like to think of it letting your mind off leash. Like my, ha my dog's happiest state of existence is off leash. She's just running and smelling and she's, and think of your mind that way. When you let your mind off leash, it is on its own thinking. And it's called the default mode network. So there's the task positive network when you're focused and when you're not being directed on something on your screen or focused on something, your mind goes into the default mode network and it suddenly starts like going off on its own and making unusual connections. And creativity is about unusual links. So I'm always, I look at creativity like an athlete, like when am I most creative? I'm most creative in the morning, most creative on Tech Shabbat, I'm most creative when I do the dishes, when I take the shower. So now I actually force myself, I don't turn on a podcast, just take a shower. <laughs> Let it do its magic. And because I just like, I know that that happens because I know that's where ideas come. So why not let your brain get that magical time? If you optimize every friggin' second, which is the way we're living, I'm going to call this. I'm going to check on the podcast. I'm going to check the email. I'm going to go from this to this, to this, to this. Like your brain is not designed to exist where it's always on. And a full day every week will recharge you in such a profound way. So, so I find myself wondering um, whether or not the, is there a magic in it being Friday night through Saturday night? Mm -hmm. um, that's question one. Uh, there's three questions that all come about are about traditional Shabbat. Do you would you attend a life cycle event, a bar bat mitzvah on Shabbat? That's question number two. And question mm -hmm. number three is: Do you have a ritual for going back home? Yes. Okay. I okay. I love the Friday night to Saturday night because I I love knowing that Jews all over the world are doing it. Now, there's a lot of people that aren't Jewish that are doing tech Shabbats now. And, you know, Christians, you know, Sunday, you can, that's been very exciting is how many people that aren't Jewish are doing tech Shabbats. And I love that because I think it'll help with anti-Semitism. This is why, um, you know, the more things that we can share from our culture that people love, Jewish comedy, food, the better, right? I mean, this is the Shabbat is so cool. And it's like yoga and meditation to me because... I do yoga and meditation and I'm not Hindu or Buddhist. Well, I'm kind of a Jubu, but um, I get great pleasure out of doing yoga and meditation. It makes my life better. So here's a practice that's like a wisdom practice that we're sharing, I think. Um, okay, question number two. Yes, we are human. We have gone to some shivas, sadly. We've done a couple bat mitzvahs, but I'd say the whole pandemic this last year, we only made three exceptions. Um, I would say during a normal year, not pandemic year, because they were exceptions because we had to go on Zoom to do them. A normal pandemic, uh, my husband and I used to travel out for speaking. There was always a handful of times where the talk, the plane, we had to travel on Shabbat. I'll tell you, I felt horrible after it. I felt like I didn't get my recharge. And even my daughter, if she had a something, she'd say, oh, I don't feel recharged. I didn't get tech Shabbat. But yeah, life's, you know, you and I talk about this in the book, there's exceptions you make. I mean, just it's reality. And even the Orthodox Jews, they got a million exceptions and loopholes and but I try to keep it pretty solid. Like I love the boundary of Shabbat. I think that's part of the brilliance is not slippery. I find the other six days much harder with the screens. Mm -hmm. And then the third, oh, but I was gonna say in the book, like I have a best friend who's a rabbi and she's like, I always have to work on Shabbat. I'm like, then don't do it on Shabbat, do it on Sunday. So you'll make it work. What was your third question? I'm forgetting. Um, a, a, a Havdalah for te te oh. Shabbat. I, do, you know, I love Havdalah when I do it, but my kids are pretty psyched to go back online too. We all are. And that's actually, and it, we have the daylight savings. It's, you know, it, we'd have to wait way too long during the spring and summer for them to go back online. Um, and we, so I can tell you the, the double bounce of the whole tech Shabbat is I'm always excited to unplug on Friday. I run toward, I start getting excited. Like today, I'm excited about Friday. And then I'm always excited to go back on. So it has this, oh, like I live in the 21st century and there's this miraculous thing called the internet. So every week I'm like, 
can't wait to go off it. Oh no, I'm happy that it exists. So it has this dual effect, but Habdala is something I will work towards. Maybe when the kids are both out of the house that we could like get into a Habdala. I love ritual. As I've gotten older, the more I've brought rituals in, my life has gotten better. So bring on more rituals basically. Well, and some of these rituals are ways in that we connect as well as ways in which we disconnect. Um, and so one, uh, a question from the, from the audience was, how do you teach, teach slash make a teenager engage with this? Now your kids started when they were mm -hmm. six and newborn effectively. So yeah. this is part of their lives. Yeah, I have a whole chapter on this subject. It's definitely like how you present to different age kids and even partners who are like, there's always somebody in the relationship who's more addicted than the other. And I, for that, I would say have the other person read the book because there's a lot of science. There's a lot of like left brain in the book. There's a lot of right brain. Some people are going to respond to the why and some going to respond to the how. So, But for teenagers, definitely don't say we're, we're going to take away your phone for a day. Like they'll think it's a punishment. You need to present it like positive psychology presenting. What do you get back? And that's why the tagline is like giving up strains to get back more time, creativity, and connection. So I would ask your teens, I'd ask everyone in the house, you make a list. What do you wish we did more of as a family or what brings you the most joy without a screen? So everybody write it down and fill the day with that. It is a day of joy. The day of everyone's favorite foods, favorite activities, it's a, it's a fun, it has to be, you have to take away the screen and replace it with lots of joy. And remind, and remind kids how to have joy. Like I think it's a really important thing to be able to teach your kids how to have a good time without the screen because it's, it's a really important thing to exist without being entertained, numb, distracted, connected every second. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, one of the things I, I kept thinking about as you were talking is the blessing of boredom. Um, yes and that we don't get that. Um, and from a very young age, we don't get that. And I think boredom, particularly for, for well, for all of us, boredom is where I meet myself um, Ooh, and not yeah. where I distract from myself. Do you, has the, has the pandemic changed the relationships in your family with screens? Yeah, that's been, I mean, we used to have no screens upstairs. Like we have a two story house and it was like, and then no screens in the bedroom. And then suddenly there, there are schools up there. So I keep, I got very slippery for a couple months. And then Ken and I are like, whoa, they need to come out every day because like every boundary was sliding. And then, um, but it was even with me, like I was on my phone more, my whole rituals, like, and my daughter's like, hey, what? I'm like, you're right. Mine's going to go down with yours now because I, you know, I read before I go to bed. When the phone's near you and you're reading, it's so hard to focus. So I said to them, you know, we're going to, my phone's going down there too. I think out of sight, out of mind, and you will sleep so much better. Um, but the pandemic has, yeah, it changed so many routines that we also have to remember that this is going to end soon. And how do you kind of, it accelerated so many things, but then what do we need to recalibrate? Um, and so I think that's really important to think about when the pandemic has ended because life has changed in so many ways. Now, I want to show you, I want to show, I love all your questions. And I also want to show you a little film to close it off. Can I do that? Do you have another one from the audience that you're burning? I off? do actually. I have okay. a, I have a couple from the audience and then they're going to tell me I should have, um, made, um, made sure to make sure that, that you got, that I asked all these questions. <laughs> um, do you, how um, how do your friends and acquaintances know about this? This is a question from the audience. And then um, as kind of an addendum to that, <clears throat> have your f kids brought their friends into yeah. Tech Shabbat? Yeah, like, you know, if I feel like, you know, they want to be social Friday, we'll often invite their friends, family over for Shabbat, which has actually been such a beautiful way for me to get to know the kid and the family, which is good for any parental, like, absolutely. I just feel like, I'm like, hey, let's have your new friend's family over. I want to meet him. And so it's such a meaningful way to really get to know someone. And then you feel connected to the parents and which I think is also really important. So it's been a great way, um, but they don't go out. They don't go out on Friday night. They go out Saturday night. 
if they want to go out. So Friday, 6.30 to six, Saturday, 6.30 is always with family with additions. Yeah, and people can come over. I mean, people can come over and hang out with us. We try not to make too many plans. We have done it with kids and soccer and basketball. And you just write down on a piece of paper what you need to do. But we try to have a day that's not too scheduled on Saturday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we're pretty over. I mean, the pandemic's changed things. But before the pandemic, I would say, whoa, we're all over scheduled. Right. And now, you know, that's another whole element that it's just kind of took it down a notch. Um, yeah, although, the, you know, the, the, the one thing about screens in the pandemic is, is that Zoom has... It has connected us. No, for sure. And I've had people say, oh, my gosh, that's my only way to connect. And then what I would say is make a Zoom Shabbat with your family and friends that don't live near you, the last thing you do on Friday before you shut down. Like make it be like you light the candles with all the people you love, shut down, have a night of reading, of thinking, of doing other things you enjoy. Have your tech Shabbat if you live by yourself with a friend, say let's go for a walk without our phones. And then when you come back online, make it, you know, if you're, again, connect with everyone on the Zoom. There's a way to kind of sandwich the Zoom if that's your only form of connection, because I get that also. I mean, there's people living alone. It's breaking my heart. And and Zoom is offered such a solace. So it's not taking that away, but I still think it's valuable, even if you live alone in the pandemic, to have time to quiet the noise. There's been a lot of noise this year. There's a lot of noise. There's absolutely a lot of noise. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then, and then give you ch a chance to share your film, which I'm excited to see. Um, <clears throat> I kept thinking as you spoke <clears throat> that um, a lot of what you're describing feels meditative. Mm -hmm. um, and I have always thought that the character strength um, focus has been Musar like. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you are, ex if you meditate, if you practice Musar, if this, if, if you can see ways in which those things might have influenced your thinking, if those are things that you do, um, particularly, um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Musar, both because I do it and because I think it's all about character. So well, yeah, Musar is really interesting, which is what my film, The Making of a Mensch is about, which I'll send, it's a 10 minute film. But you know, at the core of Musar is about practice. Mm -hmm. and accountability and so the fact that I friggin wrote a book about this that holds me very accountable <laughs> like I'm never gonna ever not do text for this in my life no but you know everyone knows I do text about so yeah so that's a big accountability and with my family I do it that's accountability and it happens every week so and then I have this meditative practice with my husband where we write what we're grateful for what made us laugh that week but they're very musar like practices because it that is a lot about um going inward. It's about the inner work that a lot of people don't take the time to do. And it's like what it's all about. My favorite thing is by Israel Salanter, who's very important in the Musar movement, which is Rabbi Israel Salanter. He said, at first I tried to change the world and I failed. Then I tried to change my community and I failed. And then I tried to change my family and I failed. And then I worked on changing myself and I was able to change the world. And I think so much of Tech Shabbat is about that. Like, do your own work so you can bring your best self to your family, your community, and the world. Because if we're running 24 seven on all the time, responding to everything all the time, all the time, all the time, you will not give your best self to the world. You will not be recharged. I don't think there's anything I can say that should follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll show my movie. Okay, so I'm a filmmaker. No, and, okay. Oh, the fun thing I'll tell you, just because I don't say where the people work, but one of the people is um, I, uh, I made this film that I'm about to show, it premiered on January 1, but there's a couple of people in it I had never met that I had in the film. And one of them is Ari Shapiro. He's from NPR's All Things Considered. And he looks so different than what I expected. So I'm sure, let me know if you felt that way too. Um, but <laughs> I like, hear his voice all the time. Anyways, I'm going to show this movie. Da, da, da. And da, da, da. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. Have a good night. Have a good day. Have a good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year! I'm Tiffany Schlain and welcome to 2021. That was quite a year. All of it. It was super hard. 
And I know you're probably like me, we're ready for the new year. But times of our greatest struggle are when we learn the most. So what did we learn in 2020? What I learned in 2020 is what I will call the Torah of Garth Brooks. That everything that is a blessing has a curse. Or maybe you said everything that has a curse is a blessing. One of the big things I learned in 2020 was just how much work there still needs to be done in order to create a more just, equitable country. I think what I learned from 2020 is how many things that I felt were necessary that I've learned to live without. Just t taking a step back and reevaluating your priorities. Being very disciplined about gratitude, about um, telling people the way that I f like feel about them. I do a lot of calling friends, telling them that I love them, which I think freaks them out. First thing I learned is that your best friend really can be a dog. Um, because my bulldog, Jackie, my family's bulldog, like literally is my best friend in the world. And I, I didn't know that was quite possible. This year taught me that I'm more of an introvert than I realized. Being in bed at 9.30 on a Friday night watching The Great British Bake Off and not feeling like I'm missing anything was a really enjoyable feeling. I think that's maybe one of the kind of gifts in disguise of the 2020 um, mess that we've had is this idea of, of pause. So I've been thinking a lot about how do we make sure that we bring the best of what we learned into 2021? You know, sometimes that's about ritual. I know for me, my family and I, for the last decade, we turn off all screens from Friday night to Saturday night for what we call our tech Shabbats. And it's really about carving out that one day a week of Shabbat um, for a day of rest. And I know that people's pauses look very differently. It's different for everyone, but what, what do you hope to bring into 2021? I do love the concept of um, taking uh, a break and, uh, and, uh, and kind of shutting off the rest of the world. Uh, I see is really um, restorative for my own well-being and my own mental health. One thing I know for sure is that when you take the moment to pause and reflect and refresh, decompress, that serves you for days, for days. Taking one hour even can just charge you for for a week. Having a period of time where I'm not always asking what's next, what's next, what's next, what's happening now, what's happening in this moment, but I can take a step back and think in broader terms about the arc of history and the themes of what's happening and reach insights that I, I might not get if I'm just glued to Twitter all day. That allows me to do some of my best storytelling and, and I think most valuable work. I hope people don't want to go back to where we where we were. <laughs> I, I feel like that's over. I hope what we've done is cleared our vision and cleared our, our greed and cleared our, um, you know, moved into a much more truthful place with ourselves and the world so that we come out of this understanding that we are completely interconnected with everyone and everything and that our welfare depends on each other and we have to act accordingly. So let's inhale 2021, exhale 2020. I hope 2021 brings us closer to each other and to ourselves and to something greater than ourselves. Shabbat Shalom. There we go. Well, that was wonderful. I'm actually, I think I'm on, I, I'm, oh, here comes my video. That was absolutely wonderful. And I found myself thinking a great deal as I've been thinking really for the last 11 months about COVID keepers, about the mm -hmm. parts of COVID that I don't want to get rid of, that I don't want to lose touch with. So here's my final question to you. Mm. What are your COVID keepers? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that because I just wrote a list. First of all, we got a dog, which was <laughs> life changing because we traveled too much. And now we have this this love. Her name's Rosie, but we call her Rosie Tosin because she's like walking, walking oxytocin in my family. She's such a love dog. And then I've been going to the farmer's market every week. I've learned how to make an awesome chicken soup. I'm taking walks with Rosie in the Redwoods like 
four times a week when who had the time to do that? So, and I take a bath every night for an hour while I read. <laughs> like all of those things I think are in the, we're keeping those. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to suggest to all of you that are watching, first of all, I really want, I want to thank you, Tiffany Schlein, for a wonderful hour. I want to suggest to all of you that are, who are watching that there are things you need to hold on to from this really complicated and difficult year. And one of the ways to raise those up is to name them for yourself. Um, I want to thank everyone who worked so hard on this evening um, and remind you all that on April 27th, I hope I have the date right, um, we will have Tal Ben-Shahar to talk to us oh, he's about- great. He is great. To talk to us about um, creating the next steps um and we've we have really learned so much from you and had such a wonderful time with you thank you so much for giving us part of your afternoon and part of our evening uh, thank you and you know what i'll send an email to um that you can send to all the registrants that have a couple movies short films like the making of a couple films i think you'd all enjoy and um, i'll send that as a follow-up thank you so much that's just been a lovely way to spend an evening. Um, and thank you to all of you who are here with us. Thank you, especially to Mimi Cohen, Rena Koppelman, and yes. Amy Krucklack for having um, helped us continue this wonderful um, memory of Saul, who we all miss so much. Thank you all, and good evening.